All right, welcome back to part two for our ANOVA section. We were just now getting into how to actually run one of these. So first with our assumptions. Well, the first assumption is still to deal with data screening, right? So accuracy, missing, and outliers. Generally, these will be, um, missing data will be excluded because you only have one dependent variable. And outliers will be calculated with z-scores because we only have one dependent variable. And Mahalanobis only works on multiple columns. Then we have to ask if the sampling distribution is normal. Linearity, it is still called the general linear model for a reason. And homogeneity. So we've mostly been talking about homoscedasticity, right, as the, the spread of x. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, spread of Y along X. So that still matters, but it's mostly in the form of homogeneity, right? So uh, we're gonna use Levine's test to tell us if there are differences in the variances between groups. When we did our t-test, we just kind of looked <laughs> at the variances, right? We could actually run Levine's on a t-test, but generally people don't. <laughs> So how do I actually test? So Levine's is an ANOVA on the variances instead of an ANOVA on the means. So it calculates if there are group differences in those variances. Okay, Whoop. so um, we can do the normal screening we've done and just add Levine's test. Now the package we're gonna use for the ANOVA function automatically gives you Levine's, which is really nice. Okay. But either way, ANOVA is considered robust, so is T. Right. This is a robust test. Okay, Robustness is the ability to give me a result that still means something, even if the assumptions aren't quite met. So even if we don't quite have homogeneity, ANOVA is fairly robust to violations. Meaning that our F statistic probably still implies what we think it implies. I would say ANOVA is more robust to normality than it is violations of normality than it is homogeneity. Um, and so I would say put a little bit more focus on checking for homogeneity. And the test is more robust if there are equal sample sizes. But in real research, that doesn't always work out. So let's see. And don't eliminate people just to get equal sample sizes because larger sample sizes are always better. But a, a real big imbalance between groups can be problematic. And tests are more robust when sample sizes are sufficiently large. And if you remember way back to our chapter on um, data screening, also, I think we talked about this more in the variance section on the central limit theorem. Sample sizes greater than 30 in each group are more approximately normal. So let's look at Levine's test. Levine's test is an ANOVA on variances rather than the ANOVA on means. Okay. It tells you if the variances are equal across groups and you don't want this to be significant because that would imply that there are differences in the variances, which is not good for our ANOVA test. But remember the rule in data screening. So if it's P less than 001, right? Because our rule in data screening is we want it to be really bad before we do anything. So we don't want to use 0.05, we use 0.01, just like we do for outliers. And it would be considered bad if it's below that criterion. So we're going to use the EZ ANOVA function in the EZ library. I love EZ. I love psych. I love EZ. ggplot is great. I have this like list of packages that have my love and adoration, and EZ is one of them. It will do many different types of ANOVA help you with the assumption tests and give you effect sizes all at once. So while I could run this in base R using LM because it's just regression, easy makes this much more palatable. <laughs> so let's look at how easy works. The key thing in easy is that we have to add a participant number if we don't already have one in the data set. That's more critical for repeated measures ANOVA, which we're not gonna do today, but um, it requires it for all of them. And the simplest thing to do is just add an account variable, like count up one to the number of rows. But it's easier if you do that until at the end of data screening, because otherwise you'll have to keep dropping that column for the assumption test. 
So if you don't already have a participant number, add one at the end. Also, make sure your IV is factored or it won't give you Levine's for whatever reason. So even if your IV is meant to be like one, two, group one, group two, group three, make sure that is a factor variable. All right, so I am opening L easy. It's giving me a little bit of a conflict between packages here, but that's okay. And I'm going to add a participant number here by just saying, okay, my part no participant number is count up one to the number of rows. So let's just count one, two, three, four. I've said, okay, give me more decimals because otherwise this whole thing is a scientific notation. And then let's run this function. So let's look at how easy it works here. You put in the name of the data set, which we haven't done any data screening here, just to kind of give you an example of our libido data. You put in the column name for the DV, it does not have to be in quotes. The column name for the between subjects IV, which here is dose. If you have more than one, you have to do a little bit extra stuff, but we're gonna work with one right now. So the between subjects. If we're running repeated measures, um, we would change this to within. Okay. Our within subjects ID, or here is participant number for WID. This is a big thing here, type equals three. There are actually different forms of math for ANOVA, but the most common form, for better or worse, that we spent a lot of time in the last video looking at the math for is type three. So there are four, maybe more, but four common versions, and three is definitely the one that most people select. If you're ever using another statistical, statistical, statistical program, I don't know what that was. Another program like SPSS or SAS, the default is actually three. So if you want your um, information to um, match, use type equals three. And then detailed equals true so that you get uh, on the whole summary table. Now I'll get this little warning here that it's converting my participant number to a factor. That's fine. Okay, whatever. That's cool. Do that. All right, let's see here. I'm gonna zoom out temporarily so you can see the in nice layout format. So what it does is it actually creates me that really nice um, summary table. It's not quite in the same order as a regular summary table. I don't know why, but it treats uh, each kind of row as a summary. So this first row is the intercept. So we're gonna ignore that. Here's the second row, which is the dose. That's our variable. So degrees of freedom numerator, degrees of freedom denominator, that's degrees of freedom model, degrees of freedom residual. Sum of squares numerator and denominator, 20 and 23, which matches our model and residual. It doesn't show you mean squared error, but again, you can divide. We got our F statistic here, our P value, which is less than 0.05. So we would say this is significant. And then our effect size out here, which we're gonna talk about in just a minute, which is generalized eta squared. So 0.46. The other nice thing is that we get the Levine's test and it's not significant. So this implies that we have homogeneity of variances, which means we don't have to do any corrections. All right, now I printed out just Levine's all by itself here so that we can um, uh, look at those numbers. And we would, here's how we'd report it. We'd say F, Levine's test is not significant. F2 and 12 equals 0.12. P equals 0.890. Okay. I'm not sure, I don't know if Papaya yet can handle uh, easy output. Let's look. So we looked in the last one about how we could print out some really nice functions from Papaya but I'm not positive that it handles easy, but the guy who runs that is a wizard. So, okay, let's first, let's turn on true here. All right, so we see our output here. Let's see if we can try here. Saving our easy. Uh, 
run that and see if we can print here. Now, uh, APA print saved easy. Nope. Okay. So that's one reason why it's not in here. Um, I know that he had been working, they were working on this, but at the moment it doesn't handle the output from EZ very well. All right. It says, uh, no, sorry, I can't do that because I only um, handle LM objects. So if you're really good at coding, they definitely take help. <laughs> so let's hit in it real quick because I did want you to see the code on how I printed this out. I don't know why it's hidden. And we were here. Okay. Now, F's test not significant. If you want to just print that code, you can do it like this. Now, if that homogeneity test was significant, let's say Levine's test was significantly bad, because remember this would be a bad thing, because that would say that there's heterogeneity of the variances. What we could do is run a Welch test that should sound familiar because that's the correction we might run on a t-test if we have problems. And the way to do that is using one way dot test. This is in base R, so one way dot test. Look, this looks a lot like LM, right? Libido is predicted by dose. Data equals our data set. And it corrects for the amount of um, in, you know, the variance being unbalanced. And this actually wouldn't be significant. Okay, who'd say two and 7.94, which is a little weird, but corrections do that, equals 4.32 and P is 0.054. So this would be our correction. We don't need to do this because again, our Levine's test was not significant, but if you do, I just wanna show you how you could run a one-way test with that Welch correction. Now the F statistic, we would report, as F2 and 12, 5.12, rounding, P equals 0.025. And I have it as eta squared here. We're about to talk about this. Okay, and this says um, the label here is a GES for generalized data squared. Get in between subjects design, generalized data squared and data squared are the same. So we can list it as eta here. And 0.46 is quite large. Okay. Love made up data, right? Big effect. So let's talk about that. In ANOVA, there are two effect sizes, one for the overall or omnibus test and one for the follow-up tests. Just like in regression, we did R squared for the overall test, and then we did PR squared for the follow-up tests, so the coefficients. We have two different ones for our two different parts of ANOVA. Because remember, in ANOVA, you get the omnibus result, the F test, that tells you there's a difference somewhere and then you do some sort of test later to figure out where those differences are. Okay, we haven't gotten there yet. That's what it says coming next. Okay. For the F test, we could use R squared, eta squared, or generalized eta squared. And these are all the exact same math. Why are they different? There's different f flavors for different people. <laughs> I don't know. So I don't know why, but some, when we talk about it as regression, we use R squared. And when we talk about it as ANOVA, we use eta squared and they're literally the same math. So eh. okay. it's the sum of squares model divided by the sum of squares total. That's why it's really handy to have the sum of squares separate from mean squared error. Generalized eta squared is a new form that is meant to correct for different types of ANOVAs, but the one we're doing one way between subjects, okay, one way meaning one independent variable, between subjects meaning everybody's in different groups, they're mathematically equivalent. Okay. So it doesn't really matter how you list it, they're all the same in this, in this particular scenario. Now when you get into more complex ANOVAs, those are the ADA and generalized ADA are fairly different. The one that is different from these is omega squared. And I always joke that you can tell when someone learns statistics, like um, how old they are, let's just be honest, uh, by which one they like to use. Because uh, people of like sort of my generational area tend to use ADA and older folks tend to use omega, although I would say omega is making its way back around. So it's cyclical. What's the difference? Well, omega squared is meant to correct and, um, for the bias that is present in eta. 
And so it'll always be a little bit smaller and it's meant to be a better number for the population. So generalized ADA is the same idea. Like, okay, we know ADA is too big. Lots of simulation studies. It tends to be too large. So let's shrink it a little bit based on the study design and get a better estimate of our true population effect size. So overall though, the interpretation of eta omega generalized data is the same as R squared. It's the proportion of variability accounted for by our effect. And so it's the DV variance, total amount of variance, and it's how much our model accounts for that total amount of variance. So those Venn diagrams we did in that regression section still hold. And so it's useful when uh, you have more than two means. So I can know how much variance is accounted for by having these groups effectively. It can only be positive, it runs from zero to one, it's a proportion. And uh, some numbers for you, small, medium, and large. Now, I have also learned that, you know, if you take R and just square it, those might give you slightly different numbers. So the numbers for R, remember, are 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5. If I square those, I get 0 0.01, 0 0.09, and 0 0.25. So the rule with effect size, canned effect sizes, is it just really depends on the field that you're in. Some fields, these are approximate good small, medium, and larges. Right? Other fields, they may not be. All right, so we kind of covered this. So R squared is more traditionally listed if I'm doing regression. Ada is more traditionally listed with ANOVA. Why? You want to know why? Why? SPSS for a long time was the statistical program, right? We had SAS and there's Minitab and there's data and there's all these other things, but it was the program offered to professors and students at many universities. So my personal feeling on why, is, why, why list them differently, even though they're mathematically the same, is because that is how SPSS did it. They listed R squared with a regression, and then they listed eta squared with ANOVA, and so people just went with it because they didn't know any better. Okay? So now you know better. They're exactly the same. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, great part. And for a really long time, they, SPSS actually had one of the effect sizes mislabeled in their output for like forever. Although my friend told me recently they have actually fixed it after 30 years of people complaining, <laughs> this is wrong. So anyways, that's why I think why this happened, honestly. It's just simple, simple answer is people just went with, oh, it must be right. They're the ones who wrote the program, right? So uh, GES overall is a newer effect size that is um, meant to help with this overestimation. And it really is, is um, it's not different in our, our design that we're looking at, but it is different for repeated measures designs that we know have a really high over bias. Um, just like with Cohen's effect sizes that we looked at for dependent T, where I said there's a couple of different ones because we know that DZ is biased, same issue here. We know that eta squared is biased for repeated measures, so people are trying to find ways to fix that problem. And um, yeah, okay, so we've said this, they're all equal in one way between subjects and ANOVA, which is what this lecture covers. Okay. There are many other flavors of ANOVAs, <laughs> so they're not all equal in other scenarios, but in this particular scenario, they are all equal. And that's because the formula is sum of squares model divided by sum of squares total for all of them. Now, omega squared is suggested because it provides a correction on the bias that we know eta has. And it's an R squared style effect size. It's interpreted the same way, variance accounted for. Um, that is meant to kind of be the population number. And the formula here is quite gross. <laughs> and so it's sum of squares model minus degrees of freedom model times mean square residual divided by sum of squares total plus mean square residual. And it's very easy to mess up that math. So it's in the moat library. And so do omega from F. So we can approximate this, this number actually from F directly. 
um, which is a slightly different formula. You can actually do omega from sum of squares as well, but this one will get you pretty, pretty darn close. Okay. And so you say degrees of freedom model, degrees of freedom denominator, okay. F value, sample size, and alpha. So the, the formula we're using here for the F statistic is different than this one, but it gives you the same approximate answer. It's just that, uh, honestly, omega from f is much faster <laughs> mathematically. OK, so we get 0.35. How do I know I've done it mostly right? Our effect size for eta was 0.46, so it should be less. All right, so we're going to pause there, because it's a good place to stop, and save post hoc tests all for our last video. So with effect size, which one do we pick? Up to you. I generally tend to report ADA. I don't know why. I just, I like ADA, right? Or generalized ADA if I'm using uh, other designs. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Omega though. <laughs> so you can, um, you know, it's one reason where we've written this package was to help people get whichever one they wanted. So pick your favorite one um, and run with it.